Hi, my name is Mike Gavin and welcome to my KSP campaign. We got a few different missions we'll be looking at very, very shortly, but before I want to deal with something very quickly. Uh, in the last episode, I recovered my space plane using the recovery feature that is built into Kerbal Construction Time and bemoaned its limitations. Well, actually, some kind comments pointed out that actually it's not as limited as I think it is. So here we go. We'll go to our space plane hangar storage. There it is, the Otter X1. Let's edit this. Okay, yeah, that's right. Edit. And there we go. Ooh. Oh, we're pointing up in the air. I'm not quite sure why. I guess this is the way it thinks it's recovered. Okay, fine. Uh, but what I want to do is I have a purge valve that I moved through EVA. And I want to put two of these on here. So there's the purge valve that I moved and I want to stick it. I have a second one right there. And that's going to take one, oh, a little, just over a little bit over a day to make that change. I can just push this back into the building queue. Okay, now let's see what's in here in the inventory. Anything stupid? I'll also make whatever change. Oh, there's a golf club in here. Yeah, I might as well get rid of that. Yeah, any, any changes I want to make, I might as well make them right here. Should probably check on the fuel situation. Let's look up here. Oh, there's no oxidizer in that. No fuel or oxidizer in that tank. Uh-oh. Okay, it's a good thing I checked this. <laughs> this thing doesn't have anywhere near the fuel to uh, do anything useful. This must be just what was left over when I recovered it. So when you recover it, it's in the state of recovery. So we need to refuel this thing as I know that all these tanks aren't full, supposed to be full. Thankfully though, the original save of this is still there. So I was able to just check what the fuel level should be in each of these tanks. I originally started just by guessing. So here I actually, after my guesses, went and looked up what they should be in and making the adjustments. So something to remember that you do have to refuel these things. Um, but by the same token, this allows you like, for instance, with shuttles to change payloads out and to reattach boosters and all that kind of stuff. So this does make this recovery and Kerbal construction time much more versatile. Well, why don't we get on to our first mission then? So this is going to be an asteroid recovery mission. And I'm looking for a pre-selected asteroid. Here it is. WXH579, we'll select that as our target and get ready for launch. Yeah, this is a D-class asteroid that I've got to get into orbit about Minmus. And this contract, it has a bit of a storied history. My first attempt on it was with the RMD, which was launched back in episode 71. That unfortunately came to a sticky end while attempting to arrow break the asteroid. And then nine episodes later, I tried again with the exact same vehicle, but this time, well, a strutting mishap had something else to say. Yeah, I'm beginning to wonder if perhaps this mission is jinxed. And after this, I, I sort of put it to bed for a little while, but not anymore. This is the Arm E, a larger and more versatile vessel that I'll talk to in just a little bit. Right now I need to time warp to my launch window where I'll launch into an inclination that will try and match the trajectory of this asteroid. Whoa, boil off warnings. Why am I getting boil off warnings? Oh, okay, okay, well, um, I don't know if there's anything I can do about this right now. I'm just gonna still need to time warp. Be it was about a third of a day. I need the time warp to get to the point where I'm ready for my launch. So get it pretty much right. Yeah, I'm still all lined up. Let's get it right to the point where I am. My launch site is right there in the center of Kerbin. There, that ought to do it. All right. Well, let's punch it. Part of the issue that I'm having right now is actually to do with the hiatus that I have taken from this series for a little bit, and that it has been a long time since I first designed and tested this thing. So long ago, in fact, that I had completely forgotten 
I remember what the mission was, but I'd forgotten what the design was. In particular, actually, this vessel is nuclear. Uh, not the lifter, but the vessel itself is nuclear. And moreover, I had upgraded the nuclear capabilities that come with KSP Interstellar Extended. Uh, specifically, I now have access to a much wider variety of different propellants. Uh, and this particular nuclear engine uh, is using hydrolox, that is liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen as a propellant, but that needs to be kept cold. And I'll talk to the specifics as to how that all works in just a little bit, but clearly with these boil off warnings, it's not quite working right. Talk a little bit about what else is coming up in this episode. We're gonna take a look at two interplanetary probes, uh, MOHO-2 and DUNA-1. DUNA-1 in particular, it was a long time ago that I launched this thing, so you've completely forgotten about it, I don't blame you. Episode 35, that's when it was launched, but we're gonna be revisiting again this episode because it is just about at DUNA. That's for a little later, let's get back to this. Again, at this point, I really didn't know what I had <laughs> on board with this thing but I do clue into it pretty soon or at least get my first uh, bit of a clue in there I have enriched uranium as one of my resources oh my gosh it's a solid core nuclear engine back there that explains a lot about what's going on at least I can see I'm also generating electricity a little bit so uh, at least the boil offs have start stopped happening as mentioned I now have a wide choice of different propellants that I can use with my nuclear engines and I'll try and get to different uh, combinations uh, down the road in future episodes. Different propellants give you different combinations of efficiency and thrust so they all have their individual purposes but some of them are cryogenic and that means they need to be kept cold. And the way Interstellar accomplishes this, or allows you to accomplish this, is by allowing you to change the fuel type on any of the different fuel tanks that you have. And if you switch it to a type that's a cryogenic fuel, like liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen that I have here, uh, then that fuel tank will begin to consume electricity. And you have to generate that electricity, and if you don't, then you start getting boil-off problems that I'm getting here. The issue is, is that well, I don't understand why I'm getting these boil-off problems. The nuclear reactor that's in the engines at the back should be generating plenty of electricity. I've used the solid core nuclear engines that are on a few of my different vessels that are out there right now. No problems with generating electricity. So I'm a bit confused as to why I'm getting these generation issues. Also, with every new vessel, I always test it, at least to the point that I can get it into low orbit. And I'm sure I would have noticed these boil-off problems if, uh, if they were appearing during testing. So they must not have appeared during testing, which begs the question, what has changed since then? Looking over the menu here, I don't know. Oh, jeez. I've lost a lot of fuel. A lot of propellant, especially liquid oxygen. Uh, this thing isn't going to be able to make it to its asteroid, I don't think. Okay, we'll have to worry about that later because we are coming up to our circularization here. I'm sure you also would have noticed the large collection of radiators that are up there towards the front near the uh, grabbing unit. Um, the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm pretty convinced that the reason why my previous RMD exploded when it was arrow breaking the asteroid wasn't so much uh, an aerodynamic force issue as it was a heating issue. So uh, I thought maybe I'll try a whole stack of radiators up here towards the front to kind of, you know, dissipate that heat. In case I do decide to arrow break an asteroid again, I might not. Uh, but at least it keeps my options open. Okay, I can see my prograde vector is pretty close to being on the same heading as the purple target icon on the nav ball, so that tells me I'm getting things pretty close to being the right inclination to make a stab at running out towards that asteroid. Why don't we cut towards the end of this orbital insertion where you'll notice in here that I do have quite a lot of fuel still left in these boosters 
Unfortunately, that's of no use to me. <laughs> I'd love to be able to transfer these over, but uh, the liquid fuel is not the same thing as liquid hydrogen and oxidizer is not the same thing as liquid oxygen. Uh, KSB considers those different fuel types, so uh, that's probably right. So all I can do is stage these. All right, let's take a look to see what our electrical situation is. Wait, I'm not generating electricity at all. Why am I not generating electricity? Okay, let's uh, select the engines here. Activate, activate. Let's activate the engine. There we are. Still no electricity. Okay, activate the other one. Okay. I should be generating electricity, at least I have in the past. Has something changed with Kerbal Interstellar? These things don't generate electricity passively anymore? Oh, wait a minute, I got other vessels with these engines on it. Let's pay a quick visit to the Kermes 1, which is on its way to Drez. Alright, so let's take a look at their electrical situation. No, no, they're fully charged. And they have to be generating power. I know the only way these folks have of generating power right now is the nuclear engines, or the nuclear reactors in those engines. And they're definitely consuming electricity because the lab module is researching right now. And that clearly needs electricity. So these guys don't have electrical issues. I don't know, I don't know what's going on. Okay, let's see if we can get back to the army and figure this out. All right, so we'll open up our resource window and see what our situation is here. Wait a minute. We're not generating electricity. We're generating a ton of electricity. Oh, what the heck? Okay, this is clearly some sort of a glitch. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. But, you know, I was ready to own it. I was ready to sort of attribute this to, you know, from a roleplay perspective, some sort of software glitch or something like that, which I suppose is what it is. And I built this uh, resupply vessel, or at least started to build this resupply vessel to bring propellant back up to it. And I attached a big fuel cell to it so that it, it, sh it should generate enough electricity to keep everything cold and keep, and keep the uh, cryogenic fuel from boiling off. Went into simulation mode, started noticing that I was using up electricity at a pretty prodigious rate, started up the fuel cell, nothing. You know, no, the fuel cell's not working. And then I launched, and it's still not working. I'm wondering if this has something to do with, you know, when the mission clock is stopped, because the mission clock is stopped until you hit that space bar and launch. I wonder if that somehow has it messed up that it's not generating electricity with the mission clock stopped. Uh, but I need to time warp to get to my launch window and during that time I'll be running out of electricity and starting having boil off problems again and I probably could have come up with some sort of a workaround but at the time at this point uh, this was a glitch too far for me <laughs> I decided I had had enough I wasn't gonna work around this anymore I got into the save file I edited in the fuel that I should have up here so now hey I'm full up on liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Uh, sorry about that. You know, thinking in hindsight now, you know, maybe I uh, could have put on some sort of useless staging on the rocket so I could stage the rocket, start the mission clock, then uh, I would lose, then I could do the time warping, but uh, this is just too much farting around. So what you're watching here is the actual burn to get my rendezvous with the asteroid. I'll deorbit those boosters back there later. They are autonomous and can deorbit themselves. But why don't we cut to the end of the burn? And you can see here I'm getting my close encounter. We'll get our closest approach in about 14 days. We'll obviously fine tune this encounter as we get closer to it, but that's obviously going to have to be for a future episode. And from a mission in which I'm abdicating responsibility for something going wrong to one in which I'm taking, well, at least partial responsibility for something that's going wrong. This is Moho 2, 10 days out from Moho, but I'll show you here what the issue is. According to Kerbal Engineer, this thing has 3,518 meters per second left in it. You can see I already got myself a decent approach here. 
and here I'm going to take a look at what the capture cost is going to be. Capturing around Moho is always expensive. All that distance you got to fall from. You can see I actually already have a satellite in orbit about Moho. It's a mapping satellite Moho 1. Here we go. Getting in close now. And there it is, 3,900 meters per second in order for my capture. Uh, yeah, so what happened here? Uh, this guy was launched during episode 99 towards the end of a long string of interplanetary ejection burns. And I may have rushed performing the burn. I may have also mixed up my angle from retrograde and my angle to retrograde in the window transfer planner mod. Regardless, this mission is costing more than I originally planned, but we're not sunk yet. You see this glitchy mess on the side of the vessel? I do have another one here on the other side. Uh, that glitch is due to Infernal Robotics. Uh, lesson here, don't connect decouplers and docking ports to hinges. <laughs> you get stuff like this. But what we're going to do is we're going to steal the fuel here. Don't need to steal the oxidizer because it's a nuclear engine and now Kerbal Engineer is telling me that I have 4,259 meters per second of Delta V. All right. I mean, it's unlikely that these things would have been able to land anyway. But you know what? Let's put the fuel back into one of them and stage the second one just to get rid of its weight. You know, Kerbal Engineer is saying 3,856 meters per second. Uh, that is a little tight. So while we transfer the fuel back out of the lander into the main vessel, I'm going to hang on to this lander though because it does have the GravMax Gravioli detector on it. And I want to use that because it's a piece of science equipment I've yet to have around Moho. Also, I do have this remote tech communication network contract to put a communication network around Moho. And I might be able to use this thing as part of that network. I mean, if I drop it in an orbit and then shuffle the main vessel into a different orbit, and then I still have another satellite in around Mobo, Moho, I might be able to get that communication network coverage I need in order to knock off that contract too. So I'll hang on to everything, keep my options open. Again, that's going to be 10 days from now, but that is going to have to be in a future episode because right now well we're on our way to Duna oh my gosh there it is I didn't expect to see it that's awesome okay we are about three days from our closest approach to Duna so let's check to see what we got going on okay our closest approach about 45 kilometers that's just barely into the atmosphere it's not likely to affect much but why don't we just see what we can do with this encounter. Alright, we'll use a precise node here. We'll just make sure to get that maneuver node right on to periapsis. Alright, let's start giving us some retrograde. Oh, there we go. A few hundred meters per second and we got our capture. Oh my goodness, so much easier than Moho. <laughs> Why can't all the planets be like this? All right, uh, I do want to eventually get to Ike. I am kind of in the plane of Ike's orbit, so that's good. More or less, anyway. Let's see, oh, 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 that was too far. Let's move him back out again. See what we get. Oh, oh, there it is. There's an Ike encounter. Okay, I think that's what I'm going to probably do. I'll perform the burn, get the capture, swing around, and then go for Ike first. I do have some mapping contracts to do both Ike and Duna. But I think with the way this is working out, I'll go for Ike first. Yep, this is looking like I can make this work. I'm going to want to go for a polar orbit, though. So tell you what, what we'll do is we'll set up a burn just several minutes ahead of where we are right now. Uh, I don't want to perform that capture burn even a little bit in the atmosphere. There's no need for it, and I don't want to play with any arrow braking. I've got tons of fuel. And then we'll use that to adjust our trajectory around Duna, which will get us a little bit of a better encounter with Ike. 
And with a little bit of playing around, I do love the way how precise node allows you to bounce easily between these two nodes. It gets me about a 40 kilometer encounter with Ike and roughly a polar trajectory. We can fine tune all this later. Why don't we perform that first burn? It's only one meter per second. It's barely anything. You know, it's funny, going from the Fuel Challenged Moho 2, which I set up using all the data from the Window Transfer Planner and subsequently, of course, messed it up a little bit, to this Duna Pro, which is the first thing, my first interplanetary thing I launched in this series, now on its 309th day of its mission, launched 80 episodes ago, and it has fuel up the wazoo, and I did this injection more or less by eyeball. I didn't even use any fancy mods for it. Kind of shows you, I guess, sometimes maybe the old ways are best. The stage that it's currently on was actually meant only to do the ejection, and then I was going to stage it and do a burn back using the monoprop thrusters to deorbit it into Kerbin. Instead, I decided to hang on to it, and I'm glad I did. There we go, burn complete. And Kerbal Engineer is telling me that I have only 29 meters per second left in this stage. Which is actually fine. This stage was never supposed to leave Kerbin's sphere of influence, so I'm more than happy with that. Plenty of fuel still in the next stage, and I still have full monoprop containers. So what I think I'll do, I think I'll turn off the Terrier engine and activate these Puff monoprop engines. And this confuses Kerbal Engineer, which tells me I have zero Delta V, but I know that's not right. And by knowing that I have 480 kilograms of reaction mass in the monoprop, which you can just look up in the VAB, and that the mass of this vessel is right now 2,716 kilograms, I can apply the rocket equation to determine that I actually have 477 meters per second of Delta V just in the monoprop. That's enough for my capture. And enough to take the discarded stage and steer it into Ike. Fantastic. Look at the tech on this thing. It's so old. It's covered in the Oxstat solar panels only because those were the only panels I had at the time. Okay, so the capture is going to be just three days away. But looking at the time that we're at with this episode, I think I'm going to have to be drawing it to a close. So we'll be seeing that next episode. In the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.